Good morning. Buongiorno. I'll skip the rest because uh, I've already heard the rest. It was very good, and I, I can't beat that. So thanks for being here. Um, I live in Switzerland. I uh, spent 17 years in the US. So if I speak too quickly and too excitedly and say awesome too much, that's because of the US. But I'm also from Germany, so if I use perfection in my slides, that is the reason why. Uh, many of you may have never seen a futurist or listened to a futurist before. Uh, in fact, uh, in many uh, places like Germany, for example, people don't really know what a futurist is. Uh, and so I want to describe that first. It's basically a very simple thing. I don't predict the future. Right? Unfortunately, I, if I could do that, I probably would be sitting uh, in the middle of the lake here with a nice castle. Um, so I observe. My job is to observe and take a look and basically work on scenarios. My company, uh, the Futures Agency, helps companies reinvent. Uh, and sometimes that's very painful because, as you know, digital transformation is not about change. You know, change would be trivial compared to transformation. I mean, if you look at what happened, for example, in the music business, I worked for a long time as a musician and producer, a record producer, and then I went in the digital music business. I started a company like Spotify, you may know, of course, Deezer, right? Company like that. I started that in 1999, thinking that music is ready for the cloud. Yeah? But it wasn't. Right? And change is really different than transformation. Now music business is no longer physical. Right? I mean, that is a painful transformation. Uh, it's difficult, but I'll give some more examples about this. So this is really my job. Right? One is to listen and to observe. And the other one is to project uh, backwards from the future. And I think most of you could also do this job. It's not really a special gift or something. It's just I spend 90% of my time doing something that's not already here. Right? So one thing I want to advise you right from the beginning, to change your future, and the future, of course, isn't fixed, to create your future, try to spend 3 to 5% of your time on thinking what is not already here. Right? This is very important because now the speed is increasing in a mind-boggling fashion in a way that we haven't previously thought of. This is the main thing, the convergence of man and technology, uh, woman and technology as well, right? everyone really. But the convergence of man and machine. And if you, uh, uh, if you have kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? It's like the mobile device has become the extension of our brain, truly has become the extension. And that's good and bad, depending how you look at it, right? But now our entire society is moved in this direction that we have this constant convergence of man and machine. Right? Robotics, artificial intelligence, when you're using Google Maps, when you're using Siri, when you're using anything on your mobile device, there's artificial intelligence behind it. Right? I mean, most people don't even know what that is, right? uh, if you would ask them. So we're talking about a really a substantial change. And for businesses, this is the shift you know, from the old-fashioned uh, way of doing things that was more or less analog or semi-digital, right? To becoming truly digital, it's very difficult. The bigger you are, the harder it gets, right? So first, music. Second, film and television. Third, books and publishing, right? Fourth, tourism, hotels. Fifth, financial services, insurances, mining, cruise ships, you know, you name it, government, everything right there, education, right? So it's all happening basically in all industries, and this transition is something that we're looking at and we're saying things, we're seeing things like uh, this uh, project from Microsoft called HoloLens, right? Which allows you to see reality in a different way. And now we have technology that allows us, like Google Glass tried to do, it didn't really pan out there, right? But this idea of, of seeing reality in a different way will become completely normal. Right? This device is uh, proposed to cost a couple of hundred dollars and it's going to be widely used by doctors and policemen and architects and people fixing things and network engineers and, you know, being able to see superimposed information on top of your visual field. That sounds like geeky stuff now, right? Like my wife wouldn't really understand what I'm trying to say here. Right? But in five years, yeah, it will be as normal as SMS. I mean, of course, SMS will not exist in five years. Just kidding. I hope it will, at least to some degree. Right? So here's one of the key facts. We're now living in an exponential future. Exponential is not what we can understand as, as human beings, right? because we are linear. You know, we can have a maximum of 150 friends in our social circle. 
That's the normal human way. We can't have 15,000 because we have LinkedIn, right? Uh, we can't live faster because we tweet. Right? We are linear. But technology, Moore's Law, right, doubling every 18 to 24 months, so depending how you look at it, it's basically now at the takeoff point. Right? We're at the point of where all the stuff we talked about is actually happening. You know, 10 years ago, we talked about the paperless office, right? Remember that? Didn't happen. Right? Is it happening now? Absolutely. Right? We talked about the shift in re to renewable energy, right? Based on technology. Didn't really happen. Is it going to happen now? This year, yes. It's a takeoff point, right? So technology is now becoming exponentially powerful. And I like to say that humanity will change more in the next 20 years than in the previous 300. And that sounds truly crazy, right? When you think about that. Industrial Revolution 300 years ago. Now we have a major breakthrough just about every week. Right? Nanotechnology, bioengineering, geoengineering, asteroid mining, electric cars, self-driving cars, the list goes on. Every day, there's not a single day that goes by without a major breakthrough in science and technology. And then, of course, it makes us worry sometimes that technology is basically taken over everything. Right? I mean, in Japan, you can buy an electronic pet to come and greet you at the door. You know, that's something that we probably culturally wouldn't really do in Europe. I'm not knocking it, but you know, I probably wouldn't buy one. So this exponentiality, there's a very interesting story that Ray Kurzweil likes to uh, tell. I will share with you uh, briefly. When chess was invented 500 years before Christ in the Moti period in India, there was a wise man who went to the emperor and, and brought the chess game, and the emperor was really excited about the chess game. And then they had a, they had a match, and the emperor said to the wise guy, or the wise man, sorry, <laughs> wise guys are later, uh, <laughs> to the wise man, he said, what do you want if you win? And the wise man said, I want one rice corn for each field on the, on the, on the chessboard, right? And you double it every time you go to the next field. So basically, they, uh, the emperor said, that's very modest. You know, how much can that be? You know, you get one coin, then you get two coins, then you get four coins, then you get eight. You know, can't be very much. Turns out, halfway through the chessboard, it's already the entire rice consumption or production of India. And having gone all the way through the chessboard, it would be a mountain of rice that would cover the earth in one meter layer of rice, right, if he actually won. And so the guy did win, right? the wise man, and the emperor killed him, right? got him beheaded, because he realized that he couldn't pay. Right? So this is the thing about exponential. It's very hard to understand, but here's something we have to know that we have to consider. We are now in the second part of the chessboard. Right? We are in a place to where we are now entering the truly exponential force of technology. And I'm, that's not all a good thing, right? Most of that is good, but it's also quite hard to figure out what we're going to do about this. I mean, we're looking at these numbers here, right? I mean, if you're looking over here in terms of like uh, DNA sequencing, it used to cost $100,000 to get your DNA done. Now it's $840. And some people are saying it will be cheaper to flush the toilet in five years than to get your DNA analyzed. Right? I mean, the other way around, sorry. <laughs> You, you get what I'm saying. But basically, it's becoming free. Right? I mean, look at the price of music or a film. Right? Now you can subscribe to Spotify or Simfy for 10 euros a month. It used to be 20 euros for one CD. Right? I mean, the changes we're seeing here are truly exponential. Exponential increase in velocity and speed and magnitude. How many companies have become $1 billion companies, companies that are privately funded, right? 86 companies in two years are worth a billion dollars without any bank or any IPO, just privately funded. I mean, we're talking about huge economic impact of this transition, disruptive technologies, automation of knowledge work. You can download my slides later, by the way. Uh, we're going to make it available. There's quite a few slides here. But basically, uh, McKinsey says we're looking at, at an economic impact of roughly $30 trillion of this transition. And let's make no mistake about it, there's fantastic opportunities, and there's quite a bit of Darwinism here, right? If, if we're not good enough, people will just ignore us. And that goes for all of us, including myself. 
the TED conference this year will have the first time uh, where there is a robot delivering a speech about the future. Right? It'll be interesting to see. I, I doubt he can compete, but you know, <laughs> who knows, right? But anyway, uh, now we know, of course, if you have kids, again, you know, I, I traveled three years ago with my son to, uh, to Zanzibar, the first time ever that he was not connected to the internet and was sitting on the beach and hitting his mobile phone like this the whole time saying, why is, my phone is broken. I'm saying, well, there is no internet here, right? No internet, no music, no news, no feed, no Facebook. Right? It's basically not breathing, right? dead. Right? So connectivity is becoming like oxygen. In fact, connectivity in Africa and Asia and many other countries will get there sometimes before electricity, right? which is kind of a weird thing. Right? But connectivity is becoming like oxygen. That also means it will probably come, become cheaper, but even more crucial is what it will do to our lives right? and how we will deal with all the side effects of that too. For example, sensor networks. If we use sensor networks uh, in energy regulation or thermostats at home, you know, basically figuring out how our heating and air conditioning works, we can estimate about 35 to 40 percent of energy savings by being more efficient with energy. Right? Now, California is thinking about making it mandatory to use a connected thermostat, right, to save energy and water. We're talking about substantial changes based on those two facts, automation and intelligence. I would give you a piece of warning on the automation part. I think automation is inevitable and lots of jobs will be lost due to automation. For example, bookkeepers or filing clerks or call centers, maybe some taxi drivers. Right? And that is a huge social issue, of course. But automation will only last as long as it lasts. You know, you can't automate beyond one. Right? Uh, so there's an efficiency, an end of efficiency. But basically, intelligence is the more exciting part. Right? Making systems truly intelligent. Now, when you talk about intelligence, it's very important to distinguish between human intelligence, which is embodied and physical, emotional, social, intellectual, right, and machine intelligence, which is based on algorithms, for the most part. Right? Well, I should have asked Siri about that. But, um, so that's very important to distinguish. Uh, if we're looking at intelligence, for example, uh, the example of TripAdvisor is a very good story. If you like to use TripAdvisor, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes it's completely spot on, and sometimes you wonder, like, who in the world right, actually ate here and, and lived to write about it, right? It's a, it's a good data point, but it's not reality in the same way. So I sometimes say that basically TripAdvisor is some, somewhere between 5 and 20% of reality. Right? If you're in front of the restaurant, looking inside, smelling the food, seeing the people, it takes you less than three seconds, probably in most cases one second, to decide if you're going to go inside. There is a difference. Let's keep that in mind. So the other thing that's happening here is uh, that there is a temptation of thinking of uh, human processes, you know, business is a human process, basically, right, uh, as a machine process, as an algorithm. Right? And while we use technology to make business uh, perfect, in a way, and efficient, we should not think of that as being sort of a, a process of, of machines, right, an algorithm. We also need to keep in mind what it means to be truly human in the sense of actually finding a purpose for business. Now, this is also very important. So in this process of what we're doing here in technology, we're seeing this happening in the next few years, basically going from efficiency to intelligence to engagement, right? Ultimately, we want engagement with our clients, right? We don't just want them to click something or to find out stuff, right? We want them to build a relationship and then have a transaction. Let's not make a mistake and say, well, it's enough to be efficient and intelligent. It's not. Right? You don't have a relationship. You don't build trust. You don't have a business. You can be as efficient as you want. Uh, you have no brand. Nobody will buy anything from you. So that's very important to keep in mind. My friend Frank Diana has a fantastic slide here that's a little bit confusing, but it's still very worthy. Uh, showing all the stuff that's happening at this very moment that is coming towards us as a business and as people who are engaged in business. Right? 3D printing, the Internet of Things, cognitive systems, robotics, 
automation, sharing economy, I mean, all these things that you read about pretty much on a daily basis. Right? But here's the thing, these are all happening at the same time. They're combinatorial. Right? Part of your mission has to be to figure out how will all of those things converge to change your business? And how will you take advantage of it? Because they're all interactive, right? They're actually all interconnected. They're exponential interdependent. A doctor, for example, now has the possibility of taking a IBM Watson type machine or any other provider that does this, right, to take that along on his rounds in the hospital so when he sees a cancer patient, he can now pull up 158,000 cases of exactly the same cancer right, in at, the, uh, at his fingertips, right? And then he can focus on talking to the patient rather than pulling up the information. I mean, that is a huge shift in terms of cloud connectivity, mobile devices, artificial intelligence. You've all heard about Uber. Uh, this is a, a car service like a taxi that you call through an app. Most of you, I'm sure you know it. Right? There's lots of contro controversy about Uber, about them exploiting drivers and so on. But I use it a lot because it's kind of an experiment for me. And now the, uh, the University of uh, Columbia has done a study already two years ago when they started, they figured out that if Uber had 9,000 autonomous cars, you know, electric self-driving or assisted driving cars in New York City, we could do away with all of the taxis. 9,000 fully automated cars would do away with 118,000 taxis. And you would pay less and get a ride quicker. This is the kind of transformation that's going to happen. There's lots of reasons why this particular one will not happen, right? This is just an example, right? But this shows you what's happening, right? The amount of efficiency and, and change that we're seeing there is mind-boggling, right? And companies are coming out of left field like Airbnb and Uber and Dropbox, and you know, basically coming through the back door right? and solving those problems. So very important to keep that in mind is, uh, I wrote a book in 2005 after I got, got done with the music business in, in 2002, called The Future of Music. And this makes a fantastic example. This book is about 10 years old, but please don't buy it, it's actually quite old. Important part is this one, right? Looking at this slide here from Quartz, QZ.com, the music industry keeps selling less and less and less and less recorded music as a record or as a physical good, right? I mean, in fact, I think if you give your kids a CD or a DVD for Christmas, they would call a therapist, right? Uh, it's basically like that. I mean, it's, uh, I think the chart will go towards zero here. Right? So the music industry realized, you know, people are no longer buying physical goods, but they weren't ready to give up on the control of distribution. Right? So in the process of this fight, since I was involved in 1999, Napster days, basically, right, the record industry lost 71% in revenues in recorded music because they weren't ready for the shift of the customer to say music is in the cloud, right? I mean, where else will music be now? It's just a button on the device now, more or less. So here's the interesting part, you know, we really have to think about this. Peter Drucker says, in times of change, the greatest danger is to act with yesterday's logic. Now, this is something you do not want. Right? And yesterday's logic, of course, we all think with yesterday's logic, um, because that's what we have. Right? But sometimes it pays to sit down and say, what if my logic is actually no longer correct? Right? What if my assumption is not correct? This is a crucial question. Whether you make an elevators or communication systems or, or doctor's equipment or music, right? this is the question. Is it actually still the same? The answer is people do not want music as a physical good. Most of us want it as a, as a click in the cloud. right? So that's a really important question. My friend Ross Dawson had this uh, really good slide about the news business, and I, I use it as a, as a tangent, as a, a comparison to your businesses. Right? Basically, if you try to sell news for money, the so-called paywall, right? like the New York Times has tried, most of them fail miserably, because the bottom line is, it takes a lot more than the content to make a sale. I mean, content used to be about 75% advertising supported. And now with the internet, there's like a hundred different models how you can monetize content. For example, I subscribe to The Economist. 
The Economist is $150 a year. I only subscribe because I can listen to The Economist magazine in the car using their recorded tracks. That is why it's the interface, right? That's why I buy it. I mean, the writers are great, right? True. But with, without the MP3s, I wouldn't, wouldn't subscribe. So here's a lesson from the publishing business for us. Just like the publishers are transcending the idea of selling content, you know, the paywall, which didn't work, digital transformation forces us, every other leading incumbent, to transcend the products that are becoming a commodity. If you have a product that becomes a commodity because of digital, you have to figure out what else you can sell. And that's all those values around it. For example, Audi, BMW, Mercedes, and other car brands, they're not gonna sell cars in the future. That will be one of the things that they do. They say they will sell mobility, transportation, and data services. That's a much bigger arena. So we have to think this way, otherwise you know, we may find ourselves out of a spot there. For example, uh, the movie business, so you see some slides here, right? The red line is all the physical sales. The green line is all the digital sales. Now clearly, if you're Warner Pictures or Sony, right, you're not happy with this because the DVD used to cost, with region coding included, 25 euros a DVD. Now you buy iTunes, which is pretty expensive, but you can buy Netflix or Hulu or other services for 10 euros a month for 400,000 movies. And how much do you get for a movie on Netflix? 0 0.0.0.000 something, right? It's a different business model. So we can take a, a, a screenshot from this and say, okay, managing dissatisfaction, having dissatisfied customers who don't have other options. Like, you know, I live in Switzerland, I, I'm banking with Credit Suisse, and I'm, I feel like I'm the victim of managed dissatisfaction. I can't really do anything else, but every time I want to change something, it's not working. Right? Why does it cost $40 to send money to the US when you click on a button? I don't know, it's just that's the way it is, right? right? That's just being average. I can guarantee you, if you're being average in the future, you're dead. Right? There is no average. There's either going to be brilliant or new or exciting or something, right? Uh, and that's really important. So. That's where the future will take us, also because of the millennials. Right? Did you know that 75% of the workforce in 10 years will be the current millennials, which are around 30 now? And these people, many of you, or some of you are millennials, right? They think differently. They have higher expectations, they use technology, they want to make a difference. Right? They're looking for all kinds of things. So we have to keep that in mind, especially business to business, that becomes the reality that we have to face. So that means we have to think hybridly, or you could say uh, schizophrenically in a way. Right? We have to think of the business of today, which is not, for the most part, not that digital. Right? It's still fairly old fashioned and using paper. And, and then we have to think of the business of tomorrow, of the 2020 business, right? which is digitally native. And that's actually totally different. I mean, if you sell records today, it's $20, $20 a record. If you sell a stream on Spotify, you're just part of a pile of 20 million songs, right? Somehow they have to live together. So it's very important. Think about what is, but also think about what might be. Of course, that's my job, so it's easy for me to say. But you know, the, the future, clearly we know on this, on this model, the future isn't going to be fossil fuels. If you're in the oil business, you're out of luck if, that, if that's what you're betting on, right? It's totally obvious. It's certain. The question is just when. Some of my colleagues have said that this year will be the first year where some of the oil companies will jump the ship to renewable energy. So basically what we're seeing here is that in this scenario, everything and everyone is moving into the cloud. Now this is a scary thought also because the cloud currently isn't entirely secure and there's no real rule about it, right? Like who gets to administer the, the security access and who holds the identities? What laws are governing cyberspace, right? We have to solve those problems, but basically what happens here, because everything is moving into the cloud, data, business intelligence, analytics, we have huge competitive advantages. 
you will see companies that are currently employing 100,000 people, they will have 1,000 people in five years right, doing the same job. If that's good or bad for employment, I don't know. You know this is just a question of using technology. Right? That has many consequences. One of the consequences is that we can no longer live in a silo. You can't say, well, I'm the tech guy, you guys are the marketing people, you guys are the financial people, and you guys are the, uh, you know, the advertising guys or whatever, right? It's all together now. Best example is Tesla. Right? I mean, the, the car, the product is the marketing. The product is software, so you can update it. And now they're branching out into batteries and transportation. They're leaving the silos. I mean, compared to BMW or, or Audi, right, they're still very much solidly in the silo of making cars. Right? Techno uh, Tesla is not a car company. It's a technology company. So thinking about that is basically game over for the silos. Right? It's hard to realize this. You know, even if you are an engineer or a marketing person, you're going to have to know some of the other neighboring areas to come up with new business models. Mark Andreessen said this in 2011, software is eating the world. Everything that used to be hard stuff, hardware, is becoming software. Right? Music, films, books, money, driving, cars, education. That's not to say that, of course, in education we will still have universities, right? hard things, right? but everything is becoming software. That changes the mechanics of things, that changes how we do everything. Everything that can be digitized or automated will be. And I'm, I'm not saying that because I want that to happen, right? This is just a sort of a diagnosis, right? And what that means for us is we're going to have to think about the consequence in a, and how do we generate trust if things are digital? Yeah. It's actually pretty hard to generate trust when it's not real time, real place, real people. You cannot automate or digitize trust. We have to keep that in mind. We can destroy trust in a digital world. We can do that. Can we generate it? We can maintain it. Robotic cars, ships, planes. There are first debates from airlines saying that we should get rid of pilots. And this is serious, right? Because it's pretty much proven it'd be safer without them. But who would want to fly in one without a pilot? Right. Robotic pets, very popular in Japan. This thing right, called the Jibo, the world's first, first family robot. Right. Check it out on YouTube. It's quite scary. And this is all happening right now in real time. What's happening also with computing is that now computing is becoming ambient, you know, part of the environment. We don't even know that it's computing, but it is. Right. And it's actually predicting things. Many apps that we have are now in the prediction business, anticipating our next move, and giving us a kind of uh, super intelligence. I mean, I, I say parenthesis, right, because there's no such thing as super intelligence, right? It just feels super intelligent. I mean, you can use an app for sentiment reporting and for analysis, for analytics, that does the same thing that your other people have done with a staff of 400 people. Now software does it. Mind-boggling changes, predictive analytics. This is a company funded by Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook. Right? It's called Vicarious, and their headline is, we're building software that thinks and learns like a human. Are you want to scream in horror or in delight? I don't know. It's kind of like, I call this hell then, you know, hell and heaven. We don't know which one it's going to be. <laughs> That's becoming the default. IBM Watson, you can watch the videos on YouTube. Artificial intelligence helping, for example, companies like Johnson & Johnson to develop new products by analyzing hundreds of millions of data feeds and social commentary about products. Right. Financial services are about to become automated right. using what's called the robo-advisor. Charles Schwab has the first one, came out three months ago, where you have a software giving you financial advice. You should check it out. I don't really know what to think of that, but. It's basically direction. So, and logistics, right? Now we're looking at this basically saying logistics and shipping, maritime solutions, sooner or later can probably be run largely by robots and artificial intelligence. 
That's something we have to look at and what that means for society, right? But this is for certain. We're living in this world. This is a military term called VUCA. Right? Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And if you're reading this, you can safely say, well, that is really what my everyday looks like, right? And that's not going to change. This is our reality because of the complete interdependence of things. So as a response, I'm working with many of my clients on what I call flipping the VUCA, right? To have a response on this. Velocity, speed, unorthodoxy. Think Richard Branson, you think in the right direction. Collaboration and agility. And if I speak in America, I always say awesomeness rather than agility. Now it's uh, more powerful. Right? But if you put this in front of your desk, you're saying, yes, you know, it's, it's a tough place out there because everything is changing all the time. Right? You have to respond. You have to be fast. You have to be unorthodox, come up with new ideas. You have to collaborate. Because this is for, for certain in our own work. Right? Kevin Kelly from Wired Magazine said, machines are for answers. Humans are for questions. And I can guarantee you we cannot beat the machines for answers. We, we used to be able to for a while. But in the future, in, the, in the 2027, we're going to see machines reaching the same capacity than the human brain. Right now, it's the capacity of a cricket, the largest computer. In 2055, computers can match the capacity of the entire mass of human brains on the globe in terms of processing power, right? Not purely that, right? So that's very important for us to keep in mind that we are better for questions than we are for answers. Of course, that also means we have to give answers, but basically that's kind of where our future is going. Another very important thing is the duck. Right? This is the Volkerstone duck. You may remember you know, us being somewhat close to the birthplace of philosophy here. This is Descartes. Right? Descartes said that essentially animals and then humans, by, extent, by uh, extension, are kind of like fancy machines. Right? And he actually said that animals are like an automaton, like a machina, right? and can be described as a machine. And, and so this guy, Volkerson, built an artificial duck that has gotten lost, but there's many replicas. Right? You can feed this duck, this mechanical duck. Right? And therefore, to prove that all of biology is a machine. Now, the problem leads to this, really, right? Ultimately, yes, I think it's interesting to say we have to be very careful about technology should never trump humanity in business. Because when it does, your business declines, right? The business becomes a giant apparatus. It doesn't create any value. Very important to keep that in mind. The future of business is awesome algorithms and technology and what I call a humor rhythm, right? A human sense, like an algorithm. I think this is going to be very important for our immediate future. When you take the Internet of Things, Cisco says 227 billion devices connected in roughly 10 years, and some people say that Cisco is wrong. It should be roughly about 1 trillion connected devices. Traffic lights, street sensors, environmental sensors, wristwatches, everything. Think about that for a second. When that happens, and this is already happening, huh, what becomes the number one concern is safety, security, standards, collaboration. I mean, it's bad enough today if you can hack the internet and steal things from government agencies, right? but imagine in the future, if everything is networked, if your car is networked into the system, it may lock you in and not leave you out for the next 14 days and turn the air conditioner to minus 14. Right? It would be easy to do. So it becomes a real number one concern, I think, ultimately, uh, also the idea of privacy, for example. If we want to use the internet, but in return, we lose every possible right to who we are and what we can hide, what mysteries we have, what we discover, you know, what accidents happen, what lies are happening, that would be a bad thing. Right? Not that lies are a good thing, but it's human, right? Would you want your insurance to know how much you drank last night? or if you drank, right? how much you drove your car, how fast you went. Right? So what we're going to need here is kind of a social contract. I think it's very important for all of us to collaborate on these social contracts because without the social contract, there will be no security in using all of this. It's not enough to invent technology. 
We also have to invent the social contract around it so we can actually live with it. I think this is a mission for all of us to look into. So when everything is connected, that's my final point in a short summary. Uh, when everything is connected, security standards, rules, and enforcement become crucial. In the end, digital technology will be like nuclear technology. It has the power to really do great things, but it also has great, tremendous destructive power. So we have to collaborate on that as well in the long run. So let me summarize digital transformation. I think we're look, looking roughly, as uh, McKinsey said, at this uh, $30 trillion opportunity. Lots of change, especially in the workplace and how we work and uh, how we collaborate and so on. But basically, going back to my first line, the changes we're going to see in the next 20 years, if you have kids, right, you're going to want to be part of this. Right? Even if you don't have kids, you know, unless you're already 70, you may not get to see to live uh, up to 2050. But humanity will change tremendously, and this, this is the summary here. Digital transformation, absolutely everywhere. If you thought that you were safe, you're not. Right? If you're in the mining business, or the insurance business, or the banking business, the bankers thought they were safe until this year. And I live in Switzerland, to where I know what that feels like. Everything that happens to music and films and publishing is going to happen to us. It just takes longer. It's more complicated. Next point, exponential, combinatorial interdependence, right? We're moving into a world of ecosystem, in a connected world that has to collaborate. Our choice is not to hyper-compete, but to hyper-collaborate. And, and since you're here for two days, I would urge you to hyper-collaborate. Right? The only way to survive is to hyper-collaborate. Because now it, everything is interconnected. Digitization, optimization, intelligence, and humanness. Right? They are not actually an opposite. They can come together very nicely. Hybrid thinking. I mean, this is the hardest part. Now. If you're running in companies and business, you're so busy, you're already stretched 150%. Right? How are you going to think about what might be? Right? Well, I can guarantee you, if you don't think about what might be, you don't get to live to see what might be. That's mandatory now, because we're moving so fast, we don't have time to sit there and say, well, let's wait and see, like we do in, like to do in Switzerland. And flipping the VUCA. Let's respond to this challenge of transformation by being fast, by being unorthodox, coming up with ideas, collaboration, and agility. So thanks very much for listening. I want to leave you with a final quote by Alan Kay. Uh, that's what I wish for you. The best way to predict the future is to create it. Thanks very much for listening.